Good morning. My name is Allison Kaplan. I'm Director of Education at the National First Ladies Library in Canton, Ohio. I want to thank you so much for joining us today. And I want to let you know about some of our upcoming programs at the National First Ladies Library. Um, because the holidays are starting, I think this is going to be the perfect program today to kick things off. But we have a few other really great ones coming up. Um, if you have children or grandchildren, we have a fun with Flotus series that will be holiday inspired uh, related to White House and holiday decorations. We have a ladies in lab program, which you can sign up for a special um, science and history based box of STEM inspired activities this month. And then on December 14th, you can join us for a hands on class inspired by Betty Ford's 1974 Christmas decor. On December 17th, you can delve into Nancy Reagan's uh, Christmas decorations on our Facebook page and hear from our um, curator and archivist um, related to Nancy's amazing uh, holiday cards. Um, if you're looking for a holiday read, February 22nd will be our next book club and we're going to keep with the historical fiction and read um, Mrs. Grant and Madam Jewel. So we're really excited about that program. And then on January 12th, we're going to uh, screen and discuss a documentary about Michelle Obama with our friends at Stark Library. So those are some of the upcoming activities that we have going on. And let's see if we can um, get started. We're waiting on um, someone who I will introduce right now. You're about to meet Jan Turquist. Turnquist, excuse me, Executive Director of the Historic House Museum Orchard House in Concord, Massachusetts, where Little Women was written in 1868. Known as their resident, Louisa May Alcott, Jan has portrayed Miss Alcott in public service announcements, currently running nationally on Fox TV network, several BBC productions, including Blue Peter, Britain's longest running children's TV show, Bookworm, and their open university programs, as well as public television, and for First Lady Laura Bush. Jan's performance is a blend of stage drama and living history, and a living history portrayal, an actor becomes a character, just as they do in a play. But unlike a play, the audience may interact with a character and ask questions or make comments. You do not need to be an expert on Alcott's time period, which was 1832 to 1888 in order to speak to her, just be yourself. And if you have questions for Louisa May Alcott, you can leave them in the chat here um, or on Facebook Live. And um, I'm sure that she might be able to answer them. I'm not sure if she is totally hip to the technology, but we'll see. Um, so, you don't have to know anything about the time period, just be yourself. But remember, she will know nothing of the century or place, but she might want to know that I accidentally muted her before she enters the room on Zoom, if she knows a little bit about Zoom. She will stay in character and only know of her time period. So here we are in the parlor of Orchard House and Louisa has had a minor carriage accident and she's decided that she is going to walk home. So she's walking home, enjoying the fresh air, um, and I think she's on her way. So I want you to prepare yourself to travel back in time and meet with Louisa May Alcott. Oh, and Louisa, I accidentally muted you. I accidentally muted you. So you might wanna unmute yourself if you can do that. I'm so sorry. people all over. I, I, I'm i so surprised to see so many friends here. I didn't expect company, although mother did tell me someone might be coming. I'm wondering, are, are you there? I don't know. Oh, goodness gracious. I, I don't 
hear anything. I don't know. Mother? Oh, no, mother went out. Well, um, perhaps, perhaps you are there. Uh, I guess I will just have to take my cloak off. My goodness, this has been a confusing day. I, my carriage had an accident and, and I didn't know what I could do except walk home. And it was a much longer walk than I had planned. And I'm just so surprised that um, for some reason, everything's at sixes and sevens today. But um, now I've put away my, my cloak and perhaps I could just visit. You look like such nice people. Oh my, well, now, Father is away and we've had many visitors to visit with him because he started an adult program for education. He calls it the Concord School of Philosophy and Literature. But Father is not here. And do you know, ever since I wrote that book, Little Women, people have been coming up the walkway, they knock on the door. I've had many visitors. So I don't know if you're, if you're one of those who, who's interested in, in my book, Little Women. But I will tell you, I wrote it here, here in Orchard House, and I was talking about my own family. Oh, yes, I made superficial changes. I changed all the names. Call myself Joe. Call my older sister Anna, Meg. My next sister down from me, Anna's the one just a little older. She's not even two years older than I am. And then there's just under me, Elizabeth. Now, I don't change her name in the book because sadly, we lost my sister. And I thought that if I keep her name, Beth, it would be like keeping her a little closer. And then the youngest one in Little Women, Amy, is based on my youngest sister, Abigail May. But ever since she got to be in her teens, she's announced to all of us that she wants to be known by her middle name, May. So that was a fun little trick where I took May and just transposed the first two letters. May becomes Amy. Well, yes, I changed names. I changed time. I took our young years, which were lived well before this recent unpleasantness, the, the Civil War, and I changed time so that we were young during the war. Actually, we were young before the war. So I took our young years and moved them up into wartime. And that way my father would be young enough to go. In actual fact, my father was too old to serve. He would have done so for certain, but he was too old. I'm the one who went. I served as a nurse in Washington City. Well, actually, it ended up just outside of Washington City in Georgetown. And I took care of, oh my goodness, so many wounded very, very severely wounded men. It changed my life. You see, when I was younger, I loved putting on theatricals with my sisters and writing all sorts of stories. I love writing blood and thunder tales, as I called them. I love Shakespeare and Shakespeare's tragedy where everyone dies a horrible death, it seems. And I would write about witches and cauldrons and imps and fairies and love potions. And I love doing that. But when I served as a nurse in the war, I started to think that there is nothing more important than writing about my real life. And for the first time, I wrote seriously for others to read. I'd always kept journals always kept little notes about my life and had a lot to go on when I did end up writing Little Women. I had all my journals. But during that time when I was serving as a nurse, I not only kept my journals, but I wrote for others to read. I wrote letters which were actually published in the newspapers because everyone wanted to know what, what is going on in these hospitals. And I, I really began to tell all of my actual experience, even though I changed names when it was for publication, I didn't want to use real names. And ultimately a gentleman named James Redpath asked me if I would now take my letters, expand upon them and write a book 
a book for publication about my nursing experience. Well, I took everything from reality and I did change names, made sure everything was different, even my own name. I did not call myself Nurse Louisa Alcott. No, no, I was Nurse Tribulation Periwinkle. I wanted to have a bit of levity because frankly, I learned in that hospital something that I had some idea about even before I went, and that is during the hardest times, you must find something to smile about, something perhaps even to make you laugh. A little bit of humor is so important to keep you going through very dark times. And so even in my book that I ended up calling Hospital Sketches, there are humorous incidents that were real, things that really happened. And I called this book my first reality writing. And I started to think I may have found my style to write from life, even if I change superficial details. Well, I had written all sorts of things not from my life at all before that book. I wrote, as I mentioned, the blood and thunder tales often in the form of a play, but then I learned that I could write some of them and send them off to newspapers and they would publish them under a pen name. They would never have published them if they knew a woman had written them because, well, women weren't supposed to be writing for publication anyway, and they weren't supposed to write lurid tales like that. No one would, would buy the paper. So they gave me a pen name. I actually chose it myself. And these publications did help keep my family afloat. We did have some hard times and I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit more in a moment. But when I was writing the reality writing and realizing that, oh, I think I've perhaps found my style, I had to smile at my earlier self that thought, oh, I couldn't write about my real family. Why, we're too odd and dull. I never dreamed anyone would want to read about my sisters and me. No, I wrote about all the, the witches and fairies that I talked about. And I also wrote some delightful, sweet little tales about fairies. And that was actually my first publication, my first book, my first real book. You see, our dear friend, Henry David Thoreau, oh, such a good friend of the family. He was right in the middle between my parents' ages and mine. He was 18 years younger than my father and 15 years older than I am. And so he was really a family friend. And oh, he could identify any animal track when he was in the forest. He could make bird calls so perfectly that the birds would answer him. And I used to love to go with my sisters and friends walking through Walden Woods, right around Walden Pond with Henry. And we learned so many things. Oh, it, it was just a joy. And I remember one time Henry was bending down looking so tenderly at a leaf. And I thought, well, well, there must be a, an animal track that's unusual under there. He's spending so much time and he's acting so delicate about it. So I hurried over and I guess he saw the look of disappointment on my face because I, I saw nothing of interest at all. I saw a little bit of a cobweb, that was it. And with a twinkle in his eye, he looked at me and he said, Louisa, what do you see here? I just see a spider's web on a leaf. Still with that twinkle, he just shook his head. That is the handkerchief of a fairy, he said. Well, that was delightful. It set my imagination going. I could just picture the fairies, the elves, the imps playing in the treetops, sliding down leaves and landing in water puddles to just frolic and have fun. I imagined them wearing little flowers upside down on the head as a hat. Well, I could just imagine all sorts of fun for these little fairies. And Ellen Emerson, oh, some of you may know her father, Ralph, Waldo Emerson, my father's very closest friend. 
Ellen Emerson, being six years younger than I am, used to walk along with us and beg me to make up stories about these imaginary little fairies and elves and such, because of course she heard Henry Thoreau's comments as well. And so I began to make up stories for Ellen. And ultimately, I don't know if, if you've done this before, have you ever made up a story for a child and then found that the next day or the next week they want you to tell it again, but they remember it better than you do. Well, that was happening to me with Ellen. So I took time to write out these stories in great detail. And I sewed the pages together so they looked like a little book. And I gave them to Ellen as a present. Well, Ellen's father, Mr. Emerson, Ralph Waldo Emerson, loved these stories. He brought them down to show my father who then carried them into Boston to George W. Briggs, a brand new publisher on Washington Street, who decided, being new himself, he would take a chance on a new authoress and published these little fairy stories. We decided to call the book Flower Fables. He decided to publish these just in time for Christmas in 1855. However, the first copies, the pre-publication copies, came out just a little earlier, not in January of 1855, but in December of 1854, which meant that I had copies to give close family and friends for Christmas. I still remember what I wrote in the copy that I gave my mother. I wrote, dearest mother, into your Christmas stocking, I place my firstborn, for grandmothers are always kind. And my mother was so encouraging. You know, I have continued to think of all sorts of writings as sort of my children. Because you know, I have married my pen. I'm a free spinster, I paddle my own canoe. And if you marry your pen, books will be your children. Well, I say this works out perfectly because my older sister, Anna, married a human, dear John, and she has human children. Because I have books for my children, this is wonderful because Anna's children love us, but my children feed us for I sell my children. It's perfect. Well, now I suppose my my best known child is Little Women. And as I mentioned, I, I changed time and changed names and changed only superficial details, but the heart of that story is true. We really lived most of it. Now, I wasn't planning to write about my family in that sort of detail, but after the publication of Hospital Sketches, a gentleman from Roberts Brothers Publishers, Mr. Thomas Niles, wrote to me. He commented how much he had enjoyed hospital sketches and he wanted me to do the same thing with my girlhood. He said, could you do the same reality writing about your own life and we'll have it for young readers? Well, I didn't think it would work. I've already told you I thought we were odd and dull. Who'd want to read about us? But we had something that I would always call the all caught sinking fund. And I'll explain just a bit about that before I continue on my saga about Little Women. You see, unlike father in Little Women, because I told you I changed time, my father was a very passionate educator and philosopher. Now, I had the father in Little Women be a minister because I thought that felt the most like my father's character. He was so gentle and he was so thoughtful and so spiritually oriented. So I thought a minister would be fine and I should have my father in Little Women be a soldier, be a, a, a chaplain in the Civil War that way. I could give him my war experience. He would become very, very ill. That is what happened to me. I contracted typhus and pneumonia. A telegram comes to Orchard House here saying that, that they don't know if I'll survive. And father 
takes the train immediately to Washington City to bring me home. I was so ill, I didn't even know I was on a train. I was delirious. It was a very, very serious illness. So in Little Women, you can see the similarities. Father is off at war, the telegram comes, mother hurries to the train and brings father home. And he's very ill, but, but he is alive. And that, of course, is a great joy to his family. That's exactly the case with me. I was so very, very ill. And for a time, they didn't know if I would pull through. But as you can see, I did. I was 30 years old at that time. That was years ago. I, in fact, it was six more years before Mr. Niles asked me to write this girl's story. So I wrote Little Women at age 36 at a little desk upstairs that my father built for me, even though many people would say, well, a woman shouldn't have a desk of her own. It's not proper, not ladylike. And for heaven's sakes, the woman's sphere is in the domicile, not out in the public domain. So this is, this is a bad idea to uh, encourage a young woman to write. Well, father didn't agree, built me that desk of my own to encourage my writing, to give me agency. And mother gave me a wonderful gift of a pen with a little note that said, may this pen your muse inspire when wrapped in pure poetic fire. Oh my goodness, such wonderful encouragement. Well. I did keep, as I say, the heart of Little Women true. I made the sorts of changes that I've now told you about. And never in a million years did I dream that that book would succeed. I must say that, that I, I thought that when I saw, after I'd written it out, I wrote it very quickly, six and a half weeks, I just wrote, 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 wrote very fast didn't even take time to, to have proper meals. Sometimes I would go out for a run. Oh, I've always loved to run. So I looked at it after I'd written it all out and I sent the, the manuscript to Mr. Niles and he sent back a proof. And when I looked at that proof, I thought, oh dear, I don't think this will be interesting at all. Mr. Niles thought so too. He wrote me a note. He said, well, it's a little dull. Ooh. But he gave it to his niece and she and her friends devoured it. They loved it. She told her uncle how wonderful it was. And he thought, well, I think I'll publish it then. And the book came out to great acclaim immediately. The first edition was sold out in less than two months time. More editions were called for. A, a, a London publisher, Mr. Lowe, wanted to bring it out there. It began to be published in other countries, translated. My Dutch publisher wrote to me and said, well, Miss Alcott, it seems that ill-tempered, ill-mannered, ornery girls all over the world want to read about themselves. Oh, I never expected that. Do you remember how it begins? Perhaps you've read the beginning lines. Christmas won't be Christmas without any presents, grumbled Joe, lying on the rug. Oh, it's so dreadful to be poor. Ah, oh, sighed Meg, looking down at her old dress. I don't think it's fair for some girls to have lots of pretty things and other girls, nothing at all, added little Amy with an injured sniff. We've got father and mother and each other, said Beth contentedly from her corner, and the four young faces on which the firelight shone brightened at these cheerful words, but darkened again when Joe said sadly, haven't got father, shall not have him for a long time. She didn't say, perhaps never, but each silently thought it, remembering father far away where the fighting was. That's how it begins. And the poverty of the March family reflects the poverty of my actual family, but it was for different reasons. I wanted it to seem uncontroversial. So many people suffered during the war. So if fathers off at war, of course, it made sense that the women folk were struggling back home. And that for my fictional work of Little Women was perfect. In reality, 
My father, as an educator and philosopher, believed so much in the right of every single human being to be treated with dignity and respect and honor that he believed in immediate abolition, ending slavery. He was part of the Underground Railroad. Our family was, although we were too young, we girls. He was one of the early abolitionists in an early abolitionist society, as was my mother. Now this cost our family dearly. Many people did not agree with what we were doing. Even some abolitionists thought that while slavery should end, those slaves were not fully human at all. So they must not be treated as full humans. They are close to humans, but they're not fully human. My father felt that was absolutely wrong. They are fully human. And this caused a great problem in one of father's schools. He was the first teacher in Boston to admit a child who had been a slave. She was Susan Robinson, very poor. Her family had come out of slavery. And father said, well, she will come as a charity pupil and be in this classroom with the other children, many of whom had abolitionist parents. But when they learned that Susan Robinson was in the class, they came to father en masse and said, Mr. Alcott, either she goes or our children go. And we are the paying families. Father said, Susan stays. Parents withdrew children and father lost that school. Now, this sort of thing happened repeatedly for many different reasons. Father had so many ideas about education that were counter to so many of the teachers that father would know of. For example, when people said to my father, Mr. Alcott, you know you have to beat the children. If a boy's not bad now, he's about to be, just go ahead and strike. They have to learn early on that the devil is in them and you must beat them. Father absolutely disagreed. He felt that children were fresher from God. They must be understood. Father would exclude the child from a lesson if he was misbehaving. And on rare occasion, if a child was really not paying attention to the reprimand, then father might ask the child to strike him. And the child was horrified and didn't want to do it. So corporal punishment was something father did not approve. And father thought that some of the other rules that teachers had, for example, no questions in the classroom. The teacher knows what the children must be doing. And if a child is Im impudent and wants to ask a question, why well, that just encourages misbehavior. It encourages rudeness. It goes against the dictum of the child should be seen and not heard. But father thought, questions in the classroom would enhance the learning. And father thought children should have a little time when they got up from their studies and went outside to frolic about and then come back in and work again. Teachers thought that was ridiculous. And sometimes there was even laughter in the classroom. As father, for example, when he was teaching very young children, he had all ages in one classroom. And when he was teaching children as young as three and, and four years old, the alphabet, he would have them form letters. They would form, for example, this could be the letter T, if I were standing up straight in, in, in uh, pantalettes, or a Y. And the children would learn their letters by forming them in this way. And sometimes it elicited a bit of laughter. So father was doing so many things that people didn't understand that it was usually only a period of time before someone was a little concerned. It was a little bit too unusual for many of them. So this was why we moved a great deal. Before we settled here in Orchard House, this is where we've lived the longest by far, nearly 20 years so far. We moved over 20 times in our early years. And it wasn't always for a new school. Once my father thought he would start a utopian community out west of Concord in a town called Harvard, not to be confused with Harvard University, which is in Cambridge, but Harvard the town. And it's out, as I say, west of Concord. And it was 
an amazing, beautiful place, but a very difficult time. I'm afraid father learned there in only six and a half months time that perhaps humans aren't ready for perfection. And this utopian experiment did not go well. But all of these trials that made me so determined to try to help the family, and I did help in every way I could. I taught school. I wrote the Blood and Thunder Tales that I've mentioned about. I did sewing for people. I, I just, anything I could do to bring some income in. But ultimately, I discovered that my pen was the most successful method that I had. And I did succeed wonderfully with Little Women after Little Women. My writing was so much in demand, I never had to worry at all about our finances. Everything, the, the Alcott Sinking Fund rose beautifully. Everything worked out so well in that regard, except for the fact that people keep coming up the walkway. They knock on the door. They want my autograph. They want to come in. Oh, is this the house that the little women might might be see it because many people know that I set the story here in Orchard House as well as wrote it here and it's it's very very difficult I must say that that I don't mean to be rude I never want to be but you know I had 28 people come to my door last week just in that way it's hard to get anything done so I become a little porky piney about it it's it's just because I, I try so hard to be polite and then the time goes by and I'm not getting my work done and I want to keep writing the stories that children are asking for. So it's been, it's been a rather difficult time to be honest with you. But at the same time, I have to say, I'm delighted that my books are being read and that people enjoy them. If we could only manage that little difference so that people would understand that enjoy the books, but perhaps allow the author some freedom. Do you know the other day I was sitting out outside here with my little nephew, Anna's two boys are Freddie and Johnny. They call me Aunt Weedy. And suddenly here were some reporters sketching us very quickly to write about me. I just didn't expect that. And it's difficult. Sometimes I think about getting a garden engine. Do you know what a garden engine is? It's, it's, it's a way that if you can get the pressure of water up, it's, it's this hose and you can spray with it. And sometimes in my fantasy, I think, oh, I could, I could use the garden engine, keep everyone away that way, but I've never done it. And I probably never will. So I hope that perhaps some of you will come and visit me again. Um, I'm, I'm wondering now if um, perhaps I'm going to uh, oh, wait, I see. I see another person. You've come into the room. Hello. <laughs> Alcott, thank you so much for your presentation. It was so interesting and insightful. And everyone watching has uh, had a few questions for you. So if you wouldn't mind. Well, these are kind people, I can see. They're not the ones that just are rudely coming. So, and mother did invite them, I've learned. So I'd be happy to answer questions. And I told them no autographs today. <laughs> so we wanted to know what, what is the, your favorite thing that you've written? Oh, you know, I think I would say moods. It's a book for adults. I've written several different, I've, I've re-edited it. I've written two different endings for it. I keep fussing over it. It doesn't seem to quite resonate with anyone the way that I felt when I wrote it, but um, that, that is something I labored over long and hard and, and I feel quite a special affection for. I wanted to know about your, your outfit, what you're wearing, and if there's something specific that you like to wear when you're writing. Well, do you know, my mother years ago, when she could tell that I was struggling, sometimes I think anybody who's done writing would understand this. Sometimes you think you're doing fine. And then suddenly, oh, oh, it just isn't working. So my mother made for me what she calls a glory cloak. 
and it's it's some scraps that different um, we have some very well to do relatives who've sent us some lovely lovely garments that are a little past their prime and mother took some of them apart and it's just it's a wonderful thing that makes me feel grand and and she made a little cap to go with it so I wrap myself up in that glory cloak I just whatever I'm wearing it doesn't matter but that glory cloak cloak goes on top and then I feel somehow wrapped in my mother's love and in her support. And it does help me. That and a little run. How do you run in your dresses? Do you wear bloomers to run? Or well, I no, but I have to say you can sort of you you have to sort of hike them up a little bit. <laughs> and I've always managed, always managed to just do it anyway. There are a lot of questions here about Thoreau. What did Thoreau think of Little Women? And did you have a crush on him? <laughs> well, we lost Henry Thoreau before Little Women was published. So Henry Thoreau never got to know about Little Women. Um, but I did honestly think he was a wonderful, wonderful person. Now keep in mind, he was so much older than I am you know, 18, 15 years older. And um, both Henry Thoreau and my father's dear, dear friend, Ralph Waldo Emerson, who is even much older than I am because he's the age of my father. Um, both men, Henry Thoreau and Ralph Waldo Emerson, have given me so much encouragement and so much joy in my life that I think if any young girl remembers a certain time in life when there's a, an older gentleman you would never actually think oh oh i i have a crush on it oh i hope he he wants to court me no he's older but the qualities of that person have informed your life in a wonderful way and that's what you hope you will find someday in a gentleman caller who is of your own age. So I would say both Henry Thoreau and Ralph Waldo Emerson were gentlemen in that capacity for me. Not that if, oh, if either one of them had turned their affections on me as if I were going to be, you know, uh, someone that they would pursue, I would have been horrified, but they didn't. They understood. And I just thought they were both absolutely wonderful in each in their own way. Did you ever include African-American characters in your books? Why or why not? Oh, I Some definitely did. in Susan Robinson as a character. Yes, I, I definitely have done so. Um, in fact, there's another book called Work or the Story of Experience. And it's quite autobiographical as well. And I, I do include women who are of, of color who are are struggling just as so many other women are. And at the end of that book, one of the images that I love is that you see these hands, some white and some black, and they're all put, putting their hands together because they're going to help each other. And I've always felt this way because my parents have truly believed there is no difference whatsoever. We are all the same. The skin does not make the person, nor do the clothing make the person and so i've always felt that way and i feel that if if people can come to understand this our world will be so much a better place what are your feelings on women's suffrage and did you have any interaction with any of the well-known women suffragists during your time oh yes indeed my entire family believes that we must have the vote now some of you i'm sure you know susan b anthony and, and elizabeth katie stanton their approach was that women must have the vote first and then the newly emancipated African gentlemen, but women first. That was one part of the Women's Party. There was a split in the Women's Party because Lucy Stone has believed that we just all should work together. It doesn't matter who gets the vote first. We all need to have the vote universal emancip uh, universal suffrage is is what miss stone uh has long advocated now i am of that that mindset as well so when lucy stone wrote to me one day asking if i would speak at one of her meetings where she was garnering support for universal suffrage i couldn't come 
And usually going out and making speeches isn't what I tend to do anyway. I, I'd rather get my messages across in my writing. So I was writing to her and my family was gathered around as I was writing this letter. And I said to all of them, I said, well, how shall I encourage Lucy Stone? I, I, I need to say no, but I don't want her to feel that I'm not with her. And father said right away, well, you tell her you're with her in spirit. And mother said, you tell her your old mother intends to vote one day if she has to be born to the polls on the shoulders of her daughters. My little nephews, Freddie and Johnny said, well, we'd let you vote, Aunt Weedy. <laughs> so all of these sentiments were put in my letter to Mrs. Stone. Well, she likes to go by her, ma her maiden name. Uh, and she understood exactly what I meant. And we have been very, um, I guess you could say laborers in the same field, very much agreeing uh, that universal suffrage is important. And do you know that here in Concord, our select board decided that ladies could vote for school committee recently. Well, I thought this is a first step. And I went around to all the ladies because you have to register first. And I ran into people saying, oh, well, I don't know, I'm so busy. And you know, my servant quit and, and the jelly making failed. And you know, I wouldn't know who to vote for for school committee anyway, because you know, I don't know anything about those things. I'd have to ask my husband, so I might as well just let my husband vote. Oh, this was so annoying, but I voted. I was one of the very first women, there were just a handful of us that year, and we voted for school committee here in Concord, Massachusetts. Did your editors ever make you change stories like the endings or any parts of your stories? Oh yes, uh, this, this is something that authors are frustrated by. Now I'll tell you with Little Women, my plan had been that Jo March, because she's based on me, would remain a literary spinster. She would not marry. I wanted the message to go through that marriage is not the end and be all of life. It's wonderful. I see my parents' marriage. I see my sister Anna in a wonderful marriage. My sister May eventually married. I have nothing at all against marriage. In fact, if the right gentleman had come along, I would have considered matrimony myself. I actually said at Anna's wedding when I saw Mr. Emerson kiss the bride, I said, you know, it would almost be worth it to consider matrimony if I could get a kiss from Mr. Emerson. But then I decided to remain a free spinster. In any case, my editor thought this would ruin the book. Joe March is the, is the most important character. He said, she must marry. If she does not marry, it will ruin the book. And he thought it would be perfect for her to marry Laurie. Everyone thought that would be perfect. I thought it would be perfect too, which is why I couldn't do it. Nothing in my life has ever been perfect. So, you know, editors hold a lot of sway. We went back and forth and back and forth. And ultimately I decided, all right, I am, I'm going to compromise. I am not going to marry Joe March to, to Theodore Lawrence to please anyone, but I'll create a funny match for her. And I created Professor Bear. He's a little portly, he's a little older, he's a little grizzled and all my father's educational ideas are in his head so I can have the last laugh. One other question we have is, do you have any pets? Oh, we have always had cats. You know, <laughs> I don't know if, if other people have had the same problems, but I think everyone in Concord has mice who love to move in when the weather gets cold. And if you don't have cats, then you're going to have pet mice. And sometimes I say I've had both because up in the attic where the cats usually don't go, that's where the mice would be. And sometimes in, in other homes, I'd be riding up in the attic and I would name my little uh, mice friends as if they were my pets. My favorite one was Scrabble and he is mentioned in Little Women. But yes, we had cats, we had um, sometimes horses, and but they were always, I guess you could say, yes, they were pets, but they were also working pets. And then we did have birds on occasion as well. Someone is saying that as a child, they were really disappointed that Joe didn't marry Lori. But as an adult, they understand that completely from something like your perspective. Did you view them in that dual light when you were writing it? 
Yes, very much so. And and I will say to that person, you're not alone. <laughs> many, 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 many people were just devastated that Joe did not marry Lori. And, you know, I should mention that Little Women, it was originally written in two parts. 1868 was part one, 1869 was part two, and they were sold separately. So some people, part one ends before any of the Little Women have married. So there were people who, who just didn't think about marriage, reading what they said was Little Women. But then later, much later, my editor decided to put part one and part two together. But before they were put together, I would receive letters about marriage and who the little women would marry. And oh, please, please, Joe must marry Laurie. And I always thought, oh dear, they're gonna be so disappointed. <laughs> Do you know if young boys also enjoyed your books, especially little women? Yes, yes. Do you know that I was surprised one time when a grandmother came up to me and she said, my grandson loves little women more than any other book he keeps reading it he came up on it by accident his sister had finished it and he loves it but he won't tell his friends because the title little women does not sound manly enough <laughs> but i've i've talked to gentlemen one gentleman said to me that he thought i understood boys better than anyone and he loves to read not only little women but my other works as well because of the way that i understand boys so i'm delighted about that what do you think your legacy will be? Someone was saying, um, maybe there's an, a book award named after you. Did you know about that? Or what? how do you expect that your legacy will be? Well, I hope it's that people understand that I've always tried to do my best. I've always tried to be kind and helpful to others because this is how my parents raised us. So that to me is the most important part of a legacy. If someone names an award after me because of my writing, well, I, I, I will be delighted. I don't know of such a thing, but oh, tell me if it happens. I'd like to know. Someone... I was asking uh, how many books have you written uh, or particularly how many children's books? So. Well, it depends a little bit on how you count them because sometimes what I've done is I've written short pieces that get collected into Aunt Jo's scrap bag or you know little editions and sometimes they overlap, but approximately 30. And the ones that are both best known really are what some people call the Little Women series. It's Little Women, Little Men, Joe's Boys, Eight Cousins, Rose and Bloom, Under the Lilacs, Old Fashioned Girl, and Jack and Jill. Those are the ones that are most commonly known uh, for my children's stories. But I've written many, 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 many other short stories and then they get put into uh, collections. Do all of your stories have happy endings? That's an interesting question. I, I try to always, throughout the book, throughout my life, to realize that even, as I mentioned earlier, even in hard times, there are pleasures, there are joys, there are happy moments. So I try to, to keep that, that perspective in my writing. And toward the end of books, if not what you might call a happy ending exactly, at least there's the sense of hope. My family has always said, we must hope, we must not lose hope. And in hard times, we sort of say, well, let's hope and keep busy, because the keep busy part means that you do as much as you can, you don't just sit there and hope, you also have to do things to make your dreams come true, make what you're hoping for come true. Uh, so I try to keep that, that sense of a positive spirit there. I have one more question for you, Miss Alcott. Let me think about it. It just slipped my mind. Actually, I have a question for uh, Jan Turnquist. Uh, see, I heard someone in the other, let me just, I'll be right back. I'll see if I can find, hello? Someone wants to ask you a question, Miss. Yes, uh, are you Miss Turnquist? Oh good, because there's someone who wants to, oh, well, yes, they're, they're right here, come along, yes. Hello. Hi, Jan. 
Thank you so much for your performance today. It was wonderful. Well, did I miss Louisa? It seems like I always have this problem. It's a little bit like Clark Kent and Superman. I, I always just miss her. I heard a voice telling me to come in here and well, you're very kind. <laughs> I wanted to ask you first about the, the films um, and, and the space that we're lucky enough to see you sitting in, even though we don't get to interact with you in person today. It is absolutely thrilling to see the actual house as a backdrop. So I wanted to talk to you a little bit more about the the more recent film, the Greta Gerwig film, and it was used as um, a setting for the film, as I understand. Can you tell I, us a little bit about that? I was so honored to be asked to consult on that film. And I never really understood before this time the role of um, what they call a set, or no, no, not set, a production designer. Production designer is an enormously important job. And the way that I best think that I came to understand it is if you imagine that the director is going to paint on a canvas, her film is the canvas, the production designer presents the canvas for her because she, she needs to have, you know, then he works with the set designers and such, but he, the production designer is enormously important in setting the tone and such. So, Jess Goncher, who's the production designer for this Gerwig version of Little Women, met with me. By his count, we met 10 times. I, I knew we met a lot, but I, <laughs> I didn't know it was 10 times. Um, and he wanted paint colors of this house, took room measurements, photographs. Um, he felt that Orchard House itself was sort of like a little jewel box that maybe it didn't look perfect on the outside, but inside it was magical. And he felt that it was sort of the, the center of the film in a way that they keep coming back to the house again and again and again. So he knew that to try to film in this house would never work because for one thing, the rooms are too small. You have with this, these kind of productions, you have big boom microphones and big cameras and you know many, many people are, needing to be near the actors to touch up makeup and hair. And I mean, there just wouldn't have worked. And almost everything in Orchard House is authentic. I don't just mean of the period, I mean the Alcott's owned and used these things. So we have to be very, very careful. So he built a fully articulated house, not just a facade, but a fully articulated house and made it so perfect that the first time I saw it, it, it was in a different location because he wanted it to be in proximity to another house that would be the, the Lawrence family home. Uh, and so he built it on the grounds there. And I, I couldn't believe it. And uh, some people who saw it really thought it was Orchard House and would say to me, well, how did they do that? Because Orchard House has a ridge behind it. And this was perfectly flat behind it. And they thought that was CGI trying to get rid of the ridge or something. I said, no, no, that's a whole different house. But it looked exactly like Orchard House. And so it was just a joy to be a part of it in that way. I, had, I was also very fortunate to be an extra in um, several different scenes. So I got to watch Greta work and watch the actors and oh it was just marvelous it was a wonderful wonderful experience do you have a favorite object or room in the house that you could tell us about there is a little painting of an owl above louise may alcott's fireplace in her bedchamber and for some reason the first time i came into the house that little owl caught my heart and I've continued to love that. I, I love so many things about the house, but I go back to that because on so many levels, first of all, it's just a charming image. And then it's painted with such love by a sister, May, for her older sister, Louisa. And Louisa loved owls, by the way. And there had been a family of owls in a tree just outside her window when she was trying to recover from the typhus and the I didn't mention that Louisa had not only this horrible disease of typhus and pneumonia, the double, but she was treated heavily with what they thought was a, a wonderful cure, but it turned out it was nothing but poison. It was calomel, which is mercurous chloride. And when you ingest large quantities of mercury, 
all sorts of horrible things happen to you. And that was happening to her as well. So she had a lot of difficult recovery in her bedchamber above, above where I'm sitting now. And um, uh, that owl, the family of owls, the real owls in the tree and the little sounds they make at night. We still have a lot of owls around this house to this day. And I've had people say, I think they're descended from the owls that were there when Louisa lived in the house. But there's something sort of comforting and almost magical about that little sound that the owls make. Did the name of the house come from the Alcott family or is it something that was adapted it, after? No, it was Bronson Alcott himself. The house is very old. It was much older than the Alcotts. It was built in the 1600s, probably in the mid 1600s. They weren't even keeping records then. So we don't know the actual year. But over time, one of the owners planted a marvelous apple orchard. And frankly, the buildings, the house that I'm sitting in now and some outbuildings were in such horrible condition that when this land was for sale, the man who was selling it to Bronson Alcott in 1857 said, well, the buildings are, are thrown in for free. You'll, you'll wanna use them for firewood as you build a decent house for yourself, which is not what happened, but that was the assumption. And so Bronson was buying this apple orchard and some other land that was around the house. And the apple orchard was known throughout the area as being one of the best orchard. It was just beautiful. And so that's why he wanted to name the house Orchard House. We have a question if there are any ghosts in the house. <laughs> well, I personally have never met one. Um, Mrs. Alcott made an interesting comment. I don't know if any of your um, uh, friends there know about H and L hinges, but it looks like an H and it looks like an L, an upside down L. And this was a common kind of hinge used in the early days in the 1600s and 1700s. And there are H and L hinges in this house. And the saying had been that H and L hinges stand for Holy Lord and they keep evil spirits out of the house. This was the saying. Mrs. Alcott said, in my house, they stand for hope and love. I have no spirits in this house. So, you know, I, I kind of take my cue from Mrs. Alcott. I've never encountered any. If there are any, they must be the most benevolent, kind, sweet, quiet little spirits that you've ever wanted to meet. If people want to connect further with the house, I know that there's a tour that they can screen um, during COVID on your website. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yes. Well, it, Miss Alcott <laughs> uh, takes people through the house. It's a little bit short. Um, but then if you want to dwell more on specifics, we have eyes on artifacts so that for the same um, fee, it's, it's very modest $10. It allows you to take the tour of the house with Miss Alcott, and then you can peruse and, and look over these various artifacts. If you say, oh, I wanted to see more about this or more about that, because Louisa does not go into complete detail on every single thing, uh, nor do we ever do that on a tour of the house, or it would be a five-hour tour. <laughs> but just go on the website, which is very easy. If you know the name, Louisa May Alcott, that's all you need, dot org, O-R-G. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Thank Louisa for joining us too, if you run into her, Jan. <laughs> and Jan turned <laughs> us from Orchard House. I wanna thank you so much for joining us today. I wanna encourage everyone watching that you'll be able to access this talk on our YouTube page if you didn't catch the whole thing or if you wanna share it with someone else. And I also wanted to mention that we are teaming up with Stark Library. So we'll share on social media a link to a documentary about Orchard House that you can watch on Hoopla to um, accompany today's talk. So thank you so much, Jan. This was really, really wonderful. Well, and my pleasure, really, truly. I enjoyed really? very much having this little time. I have to say at the very beginning, the screen looked so different. I wasn't sure it was being recorded. So I don't know if it looked a little odd at the beginning, but I, then I thought, well, you would have said something if we had a problem. <laughs> We're fine. You are fine. I accidentally muted you though. And I felt so bad that I had oh, to- Oh, no, no. Listen, if that's the worst- You're not a character. <laughs> if that's the worst thing we have to worry about, we're pretty lucky, aren't we? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, well thank, thank you. you. Thank, Thank you. you.
This was really wonderful. And um, everyone have a, a safe uh, rest of the week and uh, please join us um, at the First Ladies Library on our social media page or on our website to register for more programs. Thank you, Jan. Thank and we'll you. see you all soon. Such a pleasure. Thank you.